I'm John Thornhill from the Financial Times, and I'm delighted first to be at this conference, and second, to be interviewing Dr. Alex Karp, the founder, co-founder and chief executive, executive of Palantir Technologies. Now, Alex, I think it's fair to say, is a somewhat unusual chief executive of a very unusual company. Uh, there are not many chief executives I can think of who have a philosophy PhD and who trained under Jürgen Herb Habermas and who have gone on to run a software company that was launched to apply data and AI to help track down terrorists after 9-11. One of his friends was quoted in the FT as saying that Alex is allergic to simplicity. And you were also quoted in that piece as saying the country that wins the AI battles of the future will set the international order. So you're in the right place today to discuss all this. I wondered if we could start by you telling us what role AI is playing in the war in Ukraine, and to the extent you can, what role is Palantir playing? Um, well, first of all, very happy to be here. Thank you for that kind introduction. Forwarded to my relatives who will be happy to know I'm so accomplished. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, that quote, just as a reference, I think was from three years ago, something like that. And, you know, when we, um, when I was saying this, uh, and when we got involved in um, what's now called AI in, in parts of the DOD, unnamed parts, um, because Silicon Valley's view of technology was please send it to the adversaries and send the carcinogens to America and the allies. Uh, you know, if you're getting really rich, why should everyone have a good life too? Um, and uh, we, uh, we took a different path, which was, um, and, and, and so when they abandoned uh, the US government's at, a, efforts to build AI in the war context, um, we had a lot of trepidation about getting involved because it, this was like five, six years ago, and AI, as it was until a couple years ago, was really a bumper sticker for fraudsters, half fraudsters, and people selling snake oil. Um, and when you're in software, you have to be very, very careful not to not be proximate to that because it all looks like a PowerPoint. Now, I, I could hand out unnamed companies where I know the software doesn't exist and they would have a PowerPoint largely copied. They would figure out what we're doing and print it up, it'd look better. The people pitching it to you will look nicer, better. In the American context, they have whiter teeth. In this context, they have a better swim style or something that's very appealing. Um, and so we got involved um, in the what's you know digitalization of warfare uh, a number of years ago. At the same time, uh, it, we were already still maintaining uh, products that we had built largely uh, for the West, but particularly useful in in in, um, in Europe because you have a, an environment where data protection and anti-terror work has to go hand in hand, and that gave us an architecture for understanding. Uh, how an enterprise would ha work with segmented data. So you just have a huge, there's a, there, typically everyone, now everyone's excited about uh, AI because it's A, not a joke, it's clearly transformative, and there's, you're seeing the results of a, open AI in, in the consumer internet context. I would, I would maintain that the history of technology from, you know, certainly in the last 100 years, is things coming from the military going to consumer, and that's also what I think primarily actually has happened uh, in AI where, and again, we're not, our role in, in, in Ukraine has been widely discussed, won't say that much about it, but as a matter of theory, um, the old way of targeting where you don't use, uh, you, where algorithms aren't used is clearly a failure. And if you, if you go into battle with uh, old school technology, even if you're spending 65 billion a year and you're highly accomplished warfighters like Russia, and you have an adversary that uh, you knows how to install and implement uh, digital, digitalized targeting in AI, you obviously are at a massive disadvantage, but uh, which, which the world heard. And that's why there's a lot of interest in AI. Um, but what's very interesting is the, the way we discuss AI in public networks, consumer internet, doesn't actually translate uh, to private networks. So if you're doing digitalization or AI on healthcare records or in the context of war, you have issues of, you know, well, in the war fighting context, you have, well, who makes the decision under what condition, who takes responsibility, who does the after and action report. If the AI makes a decision, who's responsible for that? If before war, you have the ethics of war, who starts the war under what conditions? 
during the war, what targets are taking out, what kind of targets can be taken out, what is a, you know, every country has an idea of safe harbor, i.e. targets you can't take out, targets that need special authorization, targets that need different kinds of action, action reports. You have different kinds of segmentation inside data sources. So uh, without going into any details in the Ukraine or other countries, you have very different data sources. They're structured in a different way. You have security issues. If you're working in a, at war, as you, as everyone in this room would know, you can't supply your, all your data sources, i.e. your asset sources, your human insignia, to everyone on the war field, even by proxy through an algorithm, because that can be deciphered. So how do you run algorithms and run targeting packages where these things are paramount so the adversary doesn't immediately know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and can replicate it? Um, and then in the civilian context, you know, this is a heavily regulated environment, for example, in Europe. You can't just run interjurisdictional AI on data sets in healthcare, legal, uh, pharmaceuticals, and any of the interjurisdictional AI is, for lots of good reasons, would not be allowed legally, or in my view, ethically. So how do, how do you make the AI or digitalization work in that context? That's something we've spent the last five years building. And what's super interesting now is it was a joke and when I was giving you this quote, I largely just got ridiculed by my academic friends. But like, I don't think, I think it's pretty obvious to people in this room, not as obvious maybe to people outside this room, but the, 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 the ability to dominate the war battlefield on our ethical terms, meaning where we can control who does what and under what circumstances, will define who writes the law and how it's interpreted. Now, um, this, maybe it's less controversial in Europe. It, it is particularly controversial, I think, uh, in academic circles with, in which I lingered. Um, but I view it as a banality and a fact. And certainly the fact that AI is not an incrementally better technology, like maybe mortars and tanks, where one country has a slight advantage, it is completely logarithmatic and nonlinear. And so, yeah, that's a lot. But All right. Uh, <laughs> So just to drill down in that, if I, um, with my journalistic superpowers, will summarize that as saying what you're saying is that when we talk about wars, we talk about kind of mortars and tanks, but in fact, it's data processing is now the new superpower that is enabling the Ukrainians to more than match the Russians. Well, yeah, you see, yeah, the, 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 it, it used to be that um, something like an analytic package plus, yes, but, and what I'm saying on top of it is that, um, that the, the differential lift by advanced augmented, augmented or uh, digitalized or AI is so great that powers that know how to implement this, build upon it, can defeat powers that have been spending $65 billion a year over decades. A more recent quote of yours, the power of advanced algorithms is now so great that it, it equates to having tactical nuclear weapons against an adversary with only conventional weapons. Now, is that really true? We were hearing from Professor Lawrence Freeman this morning that um, uh, when the war started, everyone thought that the Russian cyber offensive would overwhelm the Ukrainians, take out all of their civilian infrastructure. That has largely failed. What they're doing is a very kinetic attack on the Ukrainians. Look, th there's so much about this war that can't be discussed in public. I don't, think, I don't think that's exactly how this went down. But people in the room will know more than that than I, about that than I. And uh, that, so I, I don't think that's actually a fair assessment. Um, uh, I, and, 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 and were that true, then I would, then you're assuming that the the capacity, the, the capacity, first of all, there's offensive cyber and there's offensive targeting. I'm in the offensive targeting, what we build, Meta Constellation, is in the offensive targeting business. It's a different business. But I would say, so um, what, what I think is, we are at the very, very, very early day, days of AI, but in the last six months, um, uh, we went from a world where AI was, and digitalized targeting, and in general, like ability to take out targets, you could call it a digitalized kill chain, whatever you want to call it. It was a, either something for a highly erudite ethics discussion, which I find fascinating, or something that someone was pitching you to buy where the results were going to be a steak dinner. And this has now shifted to, 
your ability to identify the right technology and implement it will determine what happens on the battlefield. And I don't think there's any dispute about that. In fact, one of the major things we need to do in the West is realize this lesson is completely understood by China and Russia. And we still spend a very small amount of our budgets on this kind of technology. So if you, I, I obviously very in favor of the general budget staying even, growing inflation, going more in inflation. But if you look at budgets in the West, what are we spending that's differentiated from our adversaries? In, in, in business, you have a banality where you try to invest where people don't compete well against you. What, what we do very well in the West is figure out distributed systems that are powered by software that will allow you to fight. And this is a very specialized way of building things. This is why our software companies have done very well, quite frankly, most of them from the West Coast of the US. But this is why battle, battle, battle readiness that works this way is way. But what we need to learn is, wait a minute, what are we focused on? Who is making the decisions about uh, acquiring advanced AI digitalization and what part of the budget goes. Have they ever implemented something that works? By the way, very basic things. You're gonna get bombarded by various software products. Has the software ever been used in the battlefield? Should be the first question. Software is not a theoretical thing. I spent the first part of my life as an academic. There are a lot of theoretically relevant questions. The first question in a software context is, who's used it, how have they used it, what are the results? You can't, these things take five, six years to build if you're very good at it. And you need access to the battlefield. Like you can't build these things in a lab. So one of the advantages, quite frankly, we've had is we've been on the battlefield. Why have we had that advantage? It's one of these bug feature things because everyone in the Silicon Valley was bereft of common sense. They were busy exporting things to adversaries and corroding our system with carcinogens in the context of the consumer internet. So we got access to the battlefield. So how, for the people in the room who are actually trying to buy this software, how do they know what software works given it's all shrouded in secrecy and no one will really Oh, anybody in this room, I presume, who's buying software can get on the phone and talk to the people who are using the software. That's not their problem. The problem is what happens after you find out when it works? Is, there a procur is anyone at the top who's making these decisions talking to the people who are proxy on the battlefield? Is anyone, what portion of your budget goes to it? Probably 99% of your budget is going to very valuable things and not this kind of thing. So you need to have a wider swath. By the way, you also need a wider swath because you're gonna do new things that aren't gonna work. Um, Okay, yeah. um, this theme of this conference is responsible AI, so I'd like to get on to kind of ethics and values which you have mentioned. I mean, I guess to massively oversimplify, in uh, America, particularly after 9-11, there was a theory that the ends justify the means that the national security... Not our everything. theory. I know, yeah. uh, we'll come to that. Uh, in Europe, I think it, there's a, clearly an argument that individual rights are in some respects more important than national security. So which is the bigger problem, big terror or big yeah, brother? Yeah, we, so can yeah, you reconcile yeah. these our, two? Our, well, I'll give, it's always interesting to tell people they, things that they will, don't believe, probably justify, we will never believe, but are true. A lot of the reason why my company succeeded was in the beginning, post 9-11, everyone was like, oh, build, find terrorists, we don't care how. Most of our investors were like, find terrorists, we don't care how. And one of, you make lots of mistakes when you do things, and I may have made a lot of mistakes. One of the best decisions I ever made was reflecting upon Hegel. We can have a dialectic. We're going to find terrorists and protect data protection. And why is that important? And by the way, we hadn't even bothered selling our product to Europe, which is, you may, you may not know it, but almost every European country in some form or another uses our CT product, counterterrorism product. And why do they use it? Because if you just find the terrorists and you ab abandon civil liberties, you lose half the society, in my view, correctly. Do you want everyone knowing what you do in your personal life? I don't. And I think it's our God-given right to have parts of our personal lives that are protected. You can't, but if you don't find the terrorists, and this is where I disagree with a, a lot of my academic friends, you're going to have goose stepping in the streets. And I got yelled at all over the world for saying, our product, Palantir, has played an enormous role in Europe in stopping the far right. Not, there's all these conspiracy theories, not because we're in any way involved in targeting the far right, but because if you protect data and stop, stop terrorism, you get mainstream parties. If you don't protect terror, the terrorism, you get far right people. If you own, so you have to do both. 
Now, getting to the ethics, and, and what we found, by the way, is in doing both, you end up with something better because, in fact, you only need access to the data that you have access to, and you can do an incredible amount on that data. Now, you get to the AI context where it is a winner-take-all thing, and you have, again, the debate. Well, we should just throw out our ethics. Of course, our adversaries have, by Western standards, they do have ethics. They just have ethics that are very different than ours, uh, and those ethics do not include uh, segmenting data so that you can see you can see how the decision make, making was done doing af before and after uh, action reports so you can decide what can be targeted what deciding what drives the what areas ai can be involved in and what areas they can't be and i would tell you the same thing that sounds academic but has made my company very successful when you actually reach for the higher standard you end up with a much more powerful system and you bring everybody in the society with you Whereas if you just say, we're going to throw out ethics, first of all, even if you wanted to, that is not implementable in any country in this room. It's not implementable, by the way, in America. The, it's like there's a slight myth that in America, it's like we're cowboys. We're like, yeah, we just run. And it is true. We're more ready for action than, say, some other countries. But you, have, you do have very strong codes of ethics about what you're allowed to do, what can be targeted, what are the options, what happens if something went wrong, who's responsible. You, you know, in every... Western society, you have a chain of authority that goes from civilian to military. There has to be an ability to map that chain onto digitized targeting. So it how, takes, how do we do that? You need, and this is where you need an architecture, it takes five, six years to build, which allows you to segment the data and allows you to, to expose parts. First of all, AI doesn't work in private networks as well as it does in, for, very, for very simple technical reasons. You need to have a certain kind of tagging algorithm on the data. So when you're doing that tagging algorithm, you can also create an architecture, impose an architecture that can't be changed by the user on what kinds of data sets they can have, and those data sets can be made transparent as inputs into the algorithm. And you need to have that as a separate product that works with the algorithm. And every Western society is going to have to do And by the way, so that's the politically kind of progressive version. Let me give you the right wing battlefield position. I don't care about this. The reason you care about this, if you don't care about civil liberties, is because that's the only way to know that you are controlling your human and SIGINT data, and it's not being exported to adversaries in your own organization. So if you want to say, as a purely a matter of theory, your Intel services want to do a special operation with your special services, and you want to make sure that, that every bit of that data is tagged and the algorithms that are feeding into it are not exposed, you will need the same architecture that civil libertarians want. Exactly the same. And one of the most interesting things about running this business for 20 years is civil libertarians don't understand that they want the same architecture that spies and special operators want for a very different reason. They want to come home alive. That's how you come home alive. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to open it up to the audience very soon. I have one final question that I want to put in before that, which is the role of private corporations in this debate. A lot of the discussion today has been the fact that uh, we're now, in effect, outsourcing a lot of critical national security decisions to private companies, whether it's kind of Starlink in Ukraine, whether it's to Palantir Technologies in Ukraine and elsewhere, uh, whether it's Microsoft and what they were doing to protect um, Ukraine against cyber attacks and so on. So um, how can we ensure that private corporations are acting in the public good and what governance mechanisms are there in this area? Well, this, the, the, there, is a, there is a strong consensus among people in government that governments should decide and we should provide infrastructure. There's a, just a question of, does the company actually believe that or not? So obviously almost no company in Silicon Valley actually believes that. That's why there's all these lawsuits between the European Union and Silicon Valley. And, you know, but we very much deeply believe that Western institutions to decide and we should implement. So the, the implementation infrastructure comes down to who controls what happens here. I believe that should be 100% the Democratic elected officials and their representatives in the military and other organizations. That is a controversial view in Silicon Valley. It is, a, and that has to be verified. Does the company believe that or not? I 100% believe it. Our products are built to make sure that you, the mandate of power is controlled by Democratic, legitimately Democratically elected uh, officials and their representatives in mil military and intel. Um, there is another more difficult question, which is, should we build the software ourselves? I would just say, 
of course, there are lots of things you should build. And what you see in Ukraine are lots and lots of technical people building on products, including ours. And that's something that I also support. The idea you're going to build the whole infrastructure yourself, that I think is unlikely because the cultures that build these products are, were cultures of madmen and women and others. And managing that crazy group of people is going to be very, very hard in a government context. But there are also big divisions within those companies themselves, aren't there? I mean, Google famously did not participate in Project Maven because its employees were against. Uh, Palantir yourself, I mean, uh, your co-founder Peter Thiel is a big funder of uh, Donald Trump when he was president. You yourself... Yeah, and I, I called think, him but, an ass in public. Yeah. God. yeah. I think you said, I respect nothing about the dude. Yeah, and then I was uh, vulgar. I probably, um, but yeah. But... Yeah. Uh, so how, how you, you talk about companies as though they're a single entity, but in fact, th they... Yeah, but do you're, 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 you're doing something which is very fair. You're imposing your, the, our political beliefs on the decision-making. And that is a case. But at Palantir, we have a, a line and we tell everybody, um, if you do not feel comfortable supporting the legitimate efforts of America and its allies in the context of war, don't join Palantir. And so... You know, that, by the way, we are discussing recruiting. There are a lot of people who don't want to join Palantir because of that. I respect them. But then this is the wrong company for you. And we have, we, we also won't work, you know, we don't, we've never worked in China. We've never sent our products to Russia. Other people are like, are you working, sending your products to Russia? No. Well, what is, you know, so it's, 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 it's just a different beast. And we do have huge political divisions around other issues inside Palantir. We are a free discourse kind of place. Lots of people, most people at Palantir disagree with me on most issues. But he, you, and that's completely fine. You just, but if you want to be at Palantir, you're, and you, you should know. By the way, you don't have to work on the military defense. Our U.S. commercial is, is the fastest growing part of Palantir. It's growing like a, a weed um, or an oak, however. But it's, but, and you can, but you can't then come and say, I didn't know. And I do this, by the way, for example, in, in, you know, I, a German speaker, I tell, it's like, yeah, I respect the post-war German pacifism, and 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 then I've told this to right-wing people. I, we had people join a joint power like I just want to kill terrorists. Well, go somewhere else. You know, it's like that. That's not we. I really do believe in this dialectic, and the people we recruit and retain uh, internalize that, so that you are both protecting data and finding terrorists. But if you're not okay with either as a matter of ideology, you just have the wrong company, and there are lots of other companies. You're talking about the, the software. Is it uh, desirable or even possible to regulate lethal autonomous weapon systems? It are, these things should be regulated. And you have two parts, the regulation and the enforcement of the regulation. Both are going to be tough, and that's why there's got to be an immediate and concerted effort to look at how that works. And that should be very much part of the funding. Like, you know, one of the things that's worked very, very well in Europe, we always have to sign these contracts. We can't talk in, in, in Europe about who uses our product, which is slightly annoying because I'm constantly getting yelled at by people who are protected in our product. But, um, uh, but one of the things I really respect about European countries is you had to show that the product could protect data before you could get paid. And this exactly is what should happen in the autonomous, semi-autonomous governance targeting perspective. You should have to show the product to, to work in the counterterrorism context, sell your product in the counterterrorism product pro, uh, context in Europe. You have to show the product works. And what does it mean that it works? That you can actually find sophisticated actors that are hidden while protecting data. Otherwise, you cannot get the contract. It's not a PowerPoint. You have to show it working. We had one unnamed country where we power internal, external, and police in Europe. And by the time the tender was done, no one else competed because they didn't want to show the product working. But this is exactly what has to happen in this context. Okay, uh, questions. Um, please, can you keep your questions pithy and don't read out your own doctoral thesis? Uh, <laughs> uh, who has a question? We have a bearded guy here in the front. <laughs> the front. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Willems Holder from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And how do you see the AI competition between the US and China play out in the next five years? Um, th there's different parts of a the AI competition. People usually focus on AI in general terms and are 
putting two categories together, internal and external defense. Um, I don't think we are going to win, nor do I want to win, on internal surveillance. China owns that, uh, and I, I, I really hope we don't try to do anything similar to that. Uh, you have actually, the closest thing you have to that is your device. <laughs> we don't need more of that. We don't need to put that in the government monopoly of power. And so I assume that none of us want to go down that path, and I'm certainly not involved. It, it, I think that's the wrong path. Then you have targeting and other areas that involve, you know, finding targets, all the things we've just discussed. I think it's proven that we have an advantage. But then our central disadvantage is, what are we going to do with our advantage? Because right now, everyone knows we have an advantage, and we are just still operating in a world where most of our efforts are focused on hardware. I'm not against hardware development, and we should have more hardware development, and some very large portion of budget should go to hardware. But what needs to happen in the West now is focus, like, why aren't 10% of budgets on the things we're actually better on that are winning on the battlefield? That is, we are so far away from that. Like, I would say at maximally 1%, I would be more realistic. If you said software products that are useful on the battlefield, useful as defined by our adversary, not by a PowerPoint written by a consulting company, but, if, but what does China and Russia, what, what makes them, what gives them trepidation? It's like 1% of global defense budgets in the West or less. And if you defined it as something they're afraid of and has been used, actually used, not your cousin's, nephew's, local product, that, you know, that it's, it's under a tenth of a percent. That has to change yesterday. And then people like in this room have to stay involved. You know, we, we have a, you know, a, a lot of customers in very different kinds of industries. Leaders have to sit on this. This is not the thing you can afford to outsource to the deputy you don't really like, which is like one of the reasons we do so well in tech in America, in the West Coast, is we make tech a business problem. Too many institutions make it the problem of the unlikable person I'm not going to talk to. If that's, if that's going to be your approach to this, your country is going to have a huge problem. Learn, you know, it's like that's not what the, you know, the Ukrainians do. So it's like this has to be a central and personal focus of the most senior people all the way down to the bottom, backed by some, it doesn't have to be a huge part of your budget, but it can't be 1%. It's got to be like 5%, 6%, because there's got to be some room for failure. And it's like if it's a tenth of a percent, you can only actually, it's not going to work. And there has to be some ruthlessness. Look, I'm very pro-sovereignty. Our product is built to support your sovereignty. That's why... We have deployments all over Europe, and people are writing on top and the bottom below our product. I believe sovereignty is a crucial issue for every country in this room, especially the large countries in Europe, and I support that. But like, there also has to be a realistic assessment of what can I get now and what can I get tomorrow. And by the way, companies like mine are very happy to teach you how to build this stuff, but you, you got to actually buy stuff that's off the shelf as well that exists now. All right. I can't see any other questions, so... I'll Actually, there's one right here in the front. Come. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is, my name is Hans Korsta. I have a question on uh, the sovereignty part where you talked about and uh, about this technology. It looks that this technology, the, 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 guy, the company who's in front and has the real experience, has a major advantage for everybody who has to, uh, um, uh, wants to follow. And in uh, Europe, we talk about strategic uh, sovereignty, yeah, and we see that all the technology of, of this kind is coming from America. What should we do? Um, this is a very important and good question. First of all, it gets serious. Up till now, the efforts in Europe have been like, I, 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 obviously now I mentioned names, but I met someone I re very much respect from one of the largest company, countries years ago, and was like, okay, yes, it comes from America, most of us have deep roots in Europe. Have you ever talked to any of the people there? Why is it so hard to come here and work? Why, why is it that like discourse here between people who are, you know, like I'm pretty Europe affiliated. I left most, left, lived most of my life, adult life in Europe. I wrote my PhD in German. I very pro-French in, in my own way. Um, it, it, I'll leave it at in that. Your own way. Um, uh, um, it's like, 
in America, if I want a meeting with somebody, they by and large want to meet. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying everybody, and I'm offensive to some people, but like, it's like pushing a closed door here. And like, also, you know, if you want people, entrepreneurs to come here, there has to be a special program. In Singapore, I can get off a plane and I have permanent residency. You got to have something like that in Europe. Like there has to be a serious effort to partner with people like my company and others where we have a cultural affiliation, where we believe in the European values, where, but we have different skills with local things. And we have, on our, for our part, have to build platforms that you can build on top of, be willing to show people how to do it. Uh, and like, this is much more like a learned art and like that learned art exists in, it, mostly on the West Coast. And by the way, it's not all of America. It's like certain parts. But there's like a performative seriousness now. I realize it's hard in Europe because one of the things I admire about Europe is the, it's radically egalitarian. Tech is not radically egalitarian. That's just a fact. And you, that's a very hard thing for Europe to digest. I like that about Europe. I, I view myself as a classic European progressive meaning I still get to say what I think, I still have a personal life, and I want poor people to have health care and teeth, probably would be, you know, so that like makes me like far left in America and I think probably right wing in Holland, but, um, uh, but, uh, but, um, uh, um, but it, it, it's very hard culturally because this is not an egalitarian practice. But if you want your industries to be able to compete effectively for tomorrow and provide all the egalitarian benefits that I think most people in Europe cherish and that have been a light to the world, you got to get serious about this. And serious means like, what is it that who does this? Who can we learn from? How can we, who's in our local culture very good at this? I think France has done some really significant efforts on this. Um, you see efforts that are successful in Sweden. There are little offshoots, but it's, it's, you often have the impression when you talk to political leaders here, yeah, but I could never say that. I could never do that in public because it would look unfair. Tech is unfair. But if you want a fair society, you're going to need some monicum of a better software culture. And Europe is so far behind. And like, it, like everyone knows this in private, but we have to somehow do better in public because like the, the whole European experiment, which is economic progressivism is crucial. And something, by the way, that I very much personally support, but it'll be, very, it'll be completely called into question if everyone with the high value revenue is sitting in America. And it's not good, by the way, for our Western alliance. Like having an alliance where America is providing all the high value revenue and Europe is providing the dollars, that, that's not an alliance that's gonna be as strong as what I think we will need to do well against our adversaries. Get serious, Europe. Uh, I think we have to uh, finish it there. But uh, thank you very much, Dr. Karp, for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.